Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you that we're able to come into your presence and to know your hand upon us. We thank you, Lord, that you are here with us. And we ask now that as we open your word that you will speak to our hearts, that you will give us understanding of the truths that you want us to learn this day and teach us the way that you would have us to go. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. I don't know about you, but darkness can distort our thinking. It can distort our thinking, it can distort our understanding, particularly if we're not very careful within it. I remember as a young boy, when I lived in a very small timber village of about a dozen houses, having a nightmare one night, I was being chased by a mob of wild boars and I hid behind a tusk of grass and I thought, ah, oh, I'm safe. And suddenly, out of nowhere, the wildest and biggest of the lot was charging straight at me. And I was in despair and when I suddenly woke up and found myself in my bed. But wait. There's the snorting. Wait. And fear filled me. It's in the room with me. No, it's not. And it took me some time to work out that it, the noise was Dad enjoying his slumber in the next room. <laughs> so real had it been that I had to go into that next room and wake Dad up so I could get back to sleep. You see, it is... In the same way, it is easy for us to have a distorted view of scriptures. We can t look at scriptures and we think, can think that's where we are, when in fact we may not be there at all. We might be somewhere else entirely. The gospel, in the Gospels, our attention is drawn to claims Jesus made about himself when he said on a number of occasions, I am. And then he added a different phrase after those words to conclude those statements. This morning, as we look at those statements, we can see that Jesus reveals himself as the eternal Son of God. But this morning, I want us to look at just one of those statements. To I want us to consider the claim that Jesus made when he said, I am the light of the world. Wow. I am the light of the world. But the sun's the light of the world. What did Jesus mean? As we look at the word light, we see that light is a common religious symbol used in a number of religions, as well as secularly to depict understanding, to give us, to, when we see the light, we say we understand, we know what it's about. But the Christian Bible often uses the word light to signify spiritual understanding and spiritual truth. On a number of occasions, John uses light and darkness in his gospel as a contrast and a highlight between good and evil. True light is necessary for us to know reality as God wants us to know and understand it. Darkness, in the scriptures particularly, depicts our human condition with all our distorted notions about reality and our distorted notions about right and wrong. And implicit in that walking in darkness, there is great danger. Great danger. The person who walks in danger, darkness cannot see where he or she is going. And it, as a result, is unable to avoid life's pitfalls. Unable to avoid those traps that we can fall so easily into. 
Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The person who follows me will never live in darkness, but will have the light that gives life. It would have been a familiar thing to the people of Jesus' day because they would have been familiar with the huge torches that were kept alight in the temple to symbolise the pillar of fire that led the children of Israel out of Egypt. The pillar of fire that God used to direct their path and keep them focused on him and his way through that uh, wilderness period of 40 years because that pillar of fire represented God's presence with them it not only symbolised his presence it symbolised his protection it symbolised his guidance and as Jesus claims to be the light of the world he states that he can be our protection he can be our guide. He can direct us just the way those flames directed the ancient Israelites. But we should keep in mind, at the back of our mind though, that the holy flames can be as dangerous to the Israelites as they were to their enemies. If and when the Israelites failed God or failed to obey God, at that time they were reminded the Lord God is a consuming fire and a jealous God. Friends, we need to remember that ourselves so often. The Lord God is a consuming fire and a jealous God. He wants us to serve him and him only and to listen to him and obey him only. We should be warned that to forget that we are tempting God and we ignore, and ignoring God. Jesus says that he is able to give life and direction to those who follow him. That's a very bold statement, isn't it? But it's also got the equally bold implication that if a person does not follow him, that person will remain in darkness and be subject to God's wrath. Is it any wonder then that the Jewish leaders of Jesus' time challenged Jesus' claims when he said, when we read, I should say, when we read the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying on your own behalf. Your testimony is not valid. But as we consider the issue more closely, we realise that Jesus is ready to guide us, each one of us, personally. Early the next morning, Jesus went to the temple. The people came to him and he sat down and started to teach them. Jesus, you see, had come to teach in the temple court early that morning. However, he was interrupted by the teachers of the law and the Pharisees as they came. They brought with them a woman whom they claimed had been caught in the act of adultery. I can just imagine the many eyes that turned to her and look upon her as the accusation was made. And then back to Jesus as they waited for his response. How was he going to respond? Most of them would have been familiar with the scriptures and the dogmatic interpretation of the Pharisees. Adultery was punishable by death under the Jewish law. But there was a conflict because the Roman law at that time was, had overruled the Jewish law. And in a way this was another attempt to trap Jesus to conflict between the Jewish law and the Roman law. There seems to be no doubt about the guilt of the woman, although some commentators think that she may have been set up and was being used to create this crisis. Probably that is also true. Probably the woman was brought to Jesus in another attempt by the Pharisees to try and trap 
Jesus into breaking the law. Remember there's two laws there he's got to take into consideration. The Jewish law and the Roman law. If he said to stone her, he was breaking Roman law. And if he said free her, he was breaking Jewish law. We need to remember that Jesus had previously taught that he had come to fulfil the law. When he said, don't misunderstand what I have, why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Wow. He came to bring completion to what has been written in their scriptures about the promised Messiah. He was also obedient to the moral code and ethical commands made by those scriptures. In fact, we are even reminded that Jesus was recognised and accused by many as being a friend of sinners. We read, The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. All because Jesus had compassion for the downtrodden and the sinners without condoning their sin. He helped the poor and stood up for the so -called to the so-called authorities and that earned him the reputation of being a friend of sinners although he continually spoke against sin. People were what, in this situation, people were watching to see how he could possibly befriend this adulteress, what he could possibly do, who in the eyes of many was the worst of sinners. What would Jesus do? I'm sure was the question on, in many minds that morning. He could not declare her innocent because that would be against God, his God nature. To free her would be to break the Jewish law. It appeared that his love for people would bring calamity to his message and life work. How was Jesus to deal with the hypocrites who brought the woman caught in adultery? It seems that their main aim was to trap Jesus into breaking the law. For we read, they said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. At this critical point, Jesus just stooped down and wrote on the ground. What Jesus wrote there in the dust on that morning has been a cause of much speculation over the centuries. Some say he may simply have made marks in the dust to cover his embarrassment. I think it was much more than that. Some suggest that he may have started to make a list of sins of the accusers. Others say that it may have been the commandments that he wrote. But any suggestion is pure speculation. Whatever was written on the ground made the accusers stop and think about their own personal actions. The word of God will always challenge us and our actions and make us face our sin if we are willing to take notice of it. You see, Jesus challenged the Pharisees about their own sins as he wrote on that ground. We know that because of the response. In the same way, he challenges us to look at our own lives before condemning others. As I said, according to Jewish law, in any, in any sentence of capital punishment, the witnesses must begin the punishment. The witnesses were the ones that had to throw the first stone. But when they kept pressing Jesus for an answer, he stood up and I'm sure he looked at them and he said, anyone here who has never sinned can throw the first stone at her. Jesus has acutely turned the table on the accusers. They would have to claim 
complete innocence from sin in their lives and be accused of his hypocrisy or worse or else they would have to refrain from demanding the woman's death. Friends, when we try to judge the actions of others, God challenges us to take a close look at ourselves. Jesus said, Why do you see the speck in your neighbour's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you see your neighbour let, say to your neighbour, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye. Hilarious, isn't it? A speck of dust compared to a log. I grew up in timber country and those logs are pretty big things. Challenged in this way, the woman's accusers slunk off one by one, beginning with the oldest. Their actions had been exposed to the light for all to see. But how do you respond when you are challenged by the word of God? Do you ignore it or do you take notice? You see, light brings new hope. Jesus straightened up and asked the woman, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. There is no question about it. The woman was guilty. It did not matter if she was tricked into the act of... She was still guilty. Often we try to avoid our guilt by saying we were tricked or we didn't understand. Friends, that doesn't make us innocent in the sight of God. We are still guilty. How do you think the woman felt as she watched her accusers move away? No doubt she was greatly relieved. However, she did not try to run away. Something kept her there to listen to what Jesus had to say. And it was no doubt she was amazed to hear Jesus' words, Neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Friends, Jesus will repeat the same words to us when we come to him, truly seeking his forgiveness. Go, I do not condemn you, but leave your life of sin. Have you ever been caught somewhere at night with no form of light, no stars, no moon? It's pitch black. It's hard when you live in town to envisage a night like that. You need to be out in the bush somewhere. It's pitch black. You can't even see your hand in front of your face. Then someone strikes a match. It's almost day compared to what it was a moment ago. Friends, that is how it is in our relationship with God. While we are wandering around doing our own thing, it is like that night of darkness. We don't fully understand. We, we just bumble on. When we start to look to God, things start to become clear. It may be a dim light to start with, just like that match. Someone has written that Jesus is like the dawning of a new day, a light for the Gentiles. His light brings life to people. Scripture tells us, In the beginning there was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made by him and nothing was made without him. In him there was life. And that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered it. That adulteress deserved death, but received life at the hands of Jesus. She deserved to be condemned, but received pardon. Each one of us 
In God's original sight, deserve death, but we receive pardon when we come to him and seek his forgiveness. We are reminded of the scriptures that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, friends, forgiveness can be found because of God's love for humanity. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then we see that light shows the way for the last. Jesus said to the woman, Go now and leave your life of sin. Go. As he says to each one of us when we come to him, Go and leave your life of sin. You see, there is a big difference between knowing about God and actually knowing God. I can know about God, but I do not truly know God unless I am ready to be obedient to him and leave my life in his hands and his care. True discipleship is obeying Jesus Christ and learning of him and following him and doing what he calls me to do. And that involves keeping his commandments and carrying out his will. You see, Jesus made it clear to the woman that she also had a responsibility. She had to turn from her old life, her old life of sin. He meant that she needed to be sorry for what she had done and turn over a new leaf. More than that, she needed the forgiveness of God, for a new leaf on its own will not help. That forgiveness is only available where there is true repentance. Jesus made a promise to those who are willing to follow him. He promises that he will show them the way. He will be their light. Friends, in order to develop, almost every living thing needs light and water. For you to grow spiritually, you need spiritual light. And Jesus reminds us that he is the light of the world. We also need to allow his spirit to be the living water at work in our lives, to build our faith as he guides us. Because salvation is only the beginning of the walk. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. When we surrender our life to him, God uses us and gives purpose to our life. Our part is to be ready and willing to follow his leading. Jesus said, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Is that what you want for your life? When we follow Jesus, we are given a new spiritual life. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors, brought them out and said, Go, stand in the temple and tell the people the whole message about this life. Friends, there's too many people sitting in our churches today that consider Jesus Christ a convenience. Too often we only call on him when we have a problem or things go wrong. We reduce him simply to a big friend to help us when we are in trouble. That is not biblical Christianity. Jesus Christ is Lord and when we are willing to obey him, a new life and understanding begins. The woman caught in adultery was brought to Jesus for judgment, but she found compassion and help. She was able to face the remainder of her earthly life with a new hope. Jesus wants to help you today. He will not drive you away. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. 
Will you take him at his word? Loving Father, we ask that you will help each one of us to take you at your word and come to you and rest in you and allow you to guide our lives daily. In Jesus' name, Amen.